We're in John chapter 15 tonight. If you need a Bible, please raise your hand. The ushers will, will get you guys a Bible. They've been waiting so patiently holding these, these Bibles, so I know they'd appreciate if you take it off their hands. John chapter 15 tonight. Starting in verse 18, the Bible says, you guys all there? Here are a couple more pages flipping. The Bible says, if the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. God, we're so grateful for your word tonight, God. And we, as we study it together, Lord, we ask for your wisdom, Lord. We ask uh, for uh, just your, your, um, your blessing on this word, Lord. And, and uh, God, that we would apply it to our hearts, Lord. We, we thank you that your, your word is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. And, and God, we, uh, we just ask, Lord, that you would pierce our hearts with your word, that we would not just be hearers of your word this evening, God, but we would be doers of your word and we would apply it to our lives, God. We, we just uh, pray just uh, that you'd speak to our hearts in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, uh, as I was uh, growing up, I, I, have a, I have a sister. Her name's Joya. She, I love my sister. She's three years uh, younger than me. And uh, um, my sister and I, we had an interesting relationship growing up. Um, I didn't. I didn't have a. Uh, I, I. I have a, two brothers and, and another sister as well. Um, but they didn't come into the picture until I was uh, a teenager. And so, growing up with my sister, I got in a lot of fights with her because I kind of treated her like my like a brother to me, right? And we had a very interesting love, uh, you know, relationship. And uh, uh, we got into a lot of little. Uh, little disputes over, uh, you know, not, the, not the, the greatest things, maybe over the remote or uh, over a game or something like that. And, and uh, we were pretty brutal on each other, okay? So um, it probably, I should have I been the better one. I'm the oldest in the family, so I should have been the one setting the example. Unfortunately, I was not. And so uh, I, uh, I remember one time we got in a, in a little argument. She was yelling at me, and I just got mad. I took a, my football, and I threw it at her. Um, I have really great aim, apparently, hit her right in the face, and it broke her front tooth, and she swallowed her tooth. Just want to be honest and upfront with you guys. Got a lot to confess tonight. It wasn't too long, though, after that, that my, my sister was able to get me back. We're playing, uh, we got, for Christmas, we got this little pool table. And, uh, you know, for me, it felt like an adult one, but it was probably the size of this pulpit. And uh, we're, we're playing pool, and, and, of course, I beat her, like I usually do. I think she's watching tonight, so. Um, just kidding. I love you. But uh, I, I, uh, I beat her in pool. And so I decided I'm really, uh, uh, you know, a competitive person, so I decided to rub it in a little bit and do my little victory dance and uh, run around my room doing my victory lap. And uh, to my surprise, I turned around and she had the pool stick um, <laughs> by the opposite end with the fat end on top, and all I saw was just a white light was, <laughs> was the, the last thing I remember. And then I woke up with my sister going, don't tell dad, please don't tell dad, don't tell dad. <laughs> And, uh, well, this record and pattern that I set up for myself, it always went south for me because I'm the oldest. I should know better. I should be the one to set the example. Uh, my dad is a pastor, so there was always some kind of biblical lesson to learn. And uh, I need to love my sister more. Beating her is not a way to show her love, things like that. <laughs> and uh, I remember one story, uh, one time uh, when we were... Uh, when we were younger, we, we shared a room together, and uh, any of you, uh, any of you uh, guys uh, in, in the 90s got one of those, uh, those little home trampolines, and uh, there was supposed to be a little home exercise thing with, like, the trampoline was, like, just for you to sit, a little round one, you know, and uh, you're supposed to do all these exercises, but it ended up just going into the kids' room so that we could have a trampoline in our room, and that's what happened with ours, and uh, so... 
It's in our room. I'm sitting on my bed reading my sports magazine, you know, looking through my sports magazine. And, and my sister, she, wanted, she is an amazing singer, amazing uh, worship leader and, and musician. She decided she wanted to kind of stand up and be kind of a star and pretend that she was a star. So um, I was probably like six or seven, or about seven or eight at the time. She was probably about five or six. And, and uh, um, we were, uh, uh, I'm sitting there, she has stacked this whole, like, stage up, right? It was on, like a box and then a Lego box and all this stuff. So she's pretty high off the ground, and she's got her little microphone, and she's dancing. And I remember I looked over, and I said, it's probably not a great idea to do that. You're probably going to fall. And then I went back to reading my, my sports book, and as she is dancing, the, sure enough, the box slips from under her. She falls face down, and she hits the metal rim of the trampoline. And so she, it, she splits her lip wide open. She had to, eventually had to get stitches and stuff. But when she fell, a huge blood-curdling scream came shortly after. And my dad comes running in at the sound of the alarm, comes running in, and so with all of this backstory before, picture the scene. There is my sister lying on the ground, bleeding from her mouth, and me about four or five feet away with my book. <laughs> this is not going to end well for me. So my dad grabs me, spanks me, and, I'm, and my only defense was, it wasn't my, I didn't do anything. I didn't do nothing. I didn't touch her. I didn't do anything. Well, later on, after all the stitches, my dad found out the full story and figures out that I didn't actually do anything wrong. And he comes over to talk to me. Now, I'm thinking of an apology is coming my way at this point. You know, I'm thinking my dad's going to sit down. I'm so sorry. You know, I should have, I should have believed you. Um, but he was, to my surprise, is still able to turn this around to another biblical lesson. Well, Tony, if you would have changed this pattern, I wouldn't have automatically assumed that you were in the wrong. Uh, you were setting yourself up for punishment because you are guilty by association. And uh, that's what happens when you have a pastor for a dad. Uh, he can still turn anything around to teach you a Bible lesson. So hashtag pastor kid problems, hashtag PK problems is what I grew up having. Well, uh, remember where we left off in our series last week, uh, Jesus' commandment to us, he's in his discourse to his disciples, his commandment was to love one another with the same love that Christ loves us. And, well, Jesus makes an interesting transition in his discourse and says, through, after, after he gives us the command to love one another, he makes a transition and says, the world is going to hate you because it hates me. The world is going to hate you because it hates me. You're to love one another. My commandment to you is to love one another. But just to let you know, as you follow me, the world is going to hate you because it hates me. We are all guilty by association. We are all guilty by associating ourselves with Christ. Therefore, the world hates us. It's important to keep the context here as we continue through Christ's discourse. Still, it's, it's still the night before uh, Jesus is betrayed and then crucified the next morning. Remember, we're in an interesting part of John's gospel. These five chapters, chapter 13 through 17, literally deals with Thursday night of Passover week. One single night. So really from here on out until the end of the gospel, John predominantly deals with the last week of Christ's earthly ministry, the Passion Week. Last week, uh, uh, was in, last week, Jesus was encouraging this, the disciples to abide in the vine and to love one another just as Jesus loved them. This was his command to the disciples to love one another. That word love to agape, to love unconditionally, to love self-sacrificially, to love one another just as Christ has loved us. It's good, to remember that it, it, it's good to remember what Jesus was teaching and the context of this, especially as Jesus transitions and continues. This may be something different than what you've heard before. What I'm about to say may be something different than what you have heard before. Though you abide in Christ in the vine, though you have love for one another, Though you love one another with self-sacrificial, unconditional love, the love of Christ, though you could love every person you come in contact with, this is how the world is going to respond. 
hatred. Hatred. We've got so many messages around the world, all you need is love, right? The Beatles, the Beatles taught us that, all you need is love, you don't have to sing it tonight, and because uh, you don't have to sing it. Um, but, uh, you know, the, 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 message, the message of the world is love. So then, Christians, we come with the greatest love of them all, the love of Christ, to love unconditionally, there's no condition of love. It's self-sacrificial. And guess what the world's response is? Hatred. Hatred. Wait now, I thought this was supposed to be an encouraging message. I came to church to be encouraged tonight, Tony. And, and I'll confess, when, PD, uh, when Pastor Derek told me I was, uh, was teaching, I, I kind of looked ahead at where we were going to be tonight because, uh, you know, I, I, was, I was here last week uh, uh, listening. And, and uh, I'm reading through, I'm like, okay, his, I can see the, the, you know, where, where we're going to. And I go to verse 18, and I'm like, man... You got it easy, Derek, last week. He's got like abide in the vine and love. And now I got, you, we're going to be hated. So I was like, thanks a lot. You know what, though? Uh, tonight, um, I, I'll, I'll be honest with you tonight. There was a lot of spiritual warfare leading, leading up to, to tonight because I know that God has a plan for his word today. I know that God has a special plan for his word in our lives tonight as we, as we study through it. So again, I'm going to read verse 18. If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would, uh, excuse me, if you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. John opens up, if the world hates you, the word for hate literally means to pursue with hatred. It's that picture of persecution, to pursue with hatred. There's a pursuit there. So first of all, we have to think, if the world hates us because it hates Christ, who is the world? What is Jesus talking about here about the world, if the world is supposed to hate us? Well, what he's talking about here, as, as you kind of look into uh, the Greek word there, the part, it's the part of the world that is hostile towards God and his gospel, those that reject God. It's not necessarily the earth as a whole or everyone in the world, but those who have ordered their life in a way that is hostile towards God and his gospel. There are many people that are living apart from God and rejecting his message. This reality is the majority as we see today. It's the majority of the world today is it, it, they are rejecting God and his message. This has been a crazy week, we all know. And if you were with us this weekend, I loved what Pastor Derek said this Sunday, and I want to echo it again for you tonight if you weren't there. He said, I would rather be in a minority with God than in a majority without him. Isn't that so good? I'll say that again. Praise the Lord. I would rather be in a minority with God than in a majority without him. And guess what? The majority hates that. <laughs> the majority hates that. We'd rather be in the minority with God than in their majority. Well, why is that? Why would the world hate that? Well, because Jesus says here, the world hates you because it hated me before it hated you. Literally, Jesus set the pace for Christianity. In Jesus' ministry, he set the pace for Christianity. This is why the world is going to hate us, because the world hated Christ. Interesting, because John 3.16 tells us, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever should believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And yet the world hated and crucified Christ. Jesus set the pace for Christianity. The world doesn't like to be told that they are wrong. When Jesus came with this message, the world doesn't like to be told that they're living in, in the wrong. And we, being followers of Jesus, are guilty by association. Have you noticed that at all in the world today? Even just within uh, this last week, it's been very interesting to see how the world is responding with everything going on. Immediately what happened after the Supreme Court ruling, you saw the tension, right? You saw the tension immediately. 
But I find it interesting, the world is predominantly looking at how the Christians are responding. I found that really interesting to see. I, you, have you ever wondered that? Have you ever wondered, why does the world care what Christians have to say? Why do they care? Especially those who don't believe in God, why does it, even, why does it matter what Christians say? If you don't believe in God, why does it even matter what we have to say? People are getting all torn up right now with everything going on with, with those who are, who are holding fast to, to God's word and holding fast, fast to the truth of God's word. People are getting all torn up. Most of the time, people, the world, they know, they even know what we're going to say as Christians. They even know, they, they could probably put the words in your mouth as a Christian and say, this is what you're going to say to me right now. Facebook and social media, it's blowing up. <laughs> I, I have to stay off it right now. It's just blowing up on, on Facebook, all the, the statuses and everything that is, that is surrounding this. But the world is looking at the church. The world is looking at what, what is the church's opinion. How are they going to respond to this ruling? What are they going to say? Nobody is asking what does Islam say about this. Nobody's asking what does the Quran have to say about homosexuality. Nobody's asking what other, any other religion, but they're saying, Christians, what do you have to say? What do you say the Bible says about, about this? They're looking to us. And as soon as we align ourselves with the truth of God's word, as soon as we align ourselves with Christ, the world responds with hostility. The world being, again, those who have rejected God and his message. The, those who are hostile towards the gospel and towards God. It's very interesting. But remember, for those of you who are on social media, I want to encourage you guys to be careful with what you say. Be careful with what you say on social media. You know, I always think that, that uh, you know, it is so good to be able to share opinions face to face to be able to talk to somebody face to face. But I know God uses you guys so much through social media, so I just, say, I just as a word of warning, be, be mindful. Be mindful because once you, once you click post, once you quick, uh, click tweet, once you, once you have sent it out on social media, the world sees it now. And this is now a message. This is you are portraying a message to the world for the world to see. Be careful because your emotions, the tone of your voice, facial expressions, they cannot be seen in writing. And some people can take it, take it in, a, in a wrong way, take something that you're trying to say the wrong way. Make sure you're saying the truth of God's word in love. Though we are hated, we are to love one another. You know, one last thing on this. Did you all get a chance to, to read Pastor Derek's response to the Supreme Court ruling? Okay, if you haven't, it's awesome. You got to go check it out. It's on the website. You can check it out. But uh, I, I, uh, I was so blessed to see how many of you guys started sharing that on Facebook and through social media. Uh, it was quite amazing. And uh, uh, with our Facebook, with uh, Calvary's Facebook, we have the ability to see how many people the post has reached. We can see how many people who have clicked and who have opened the post, not only have shared it, but have read it and opened it up find this really amazing, that this week alone, since, since Pastor Derek posted it, posted it, this week alone, that message has reached over 15,000 people. Isn't that amazing? With all, with all the garbage that is being passed around, with all the garbage being posted up, it was so encouraging to see the truth of God's word being shared and love to over 15,000 people, and God used all of you to help with that. God used this church to help with that. And it was so encouraging to see as I kept saying, shared, 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 like all the way down my, my news feed and everything. It was so encouraging to see. And I encourage you to keep, to keep sharing the truth of God's word in love. You know, the, the, the world is looking to each and every one of us. How is the church going to respond? And we want to respond with the love of Jesus. This is ultimately how, how Christ loved us. Even while we were yet sinners, he loved us. So we ought to love one another. Well, verse 19, he, he, uh, John says, if you were of the world, and John kind of shares a little bit more commentary on this in, in uh, his first epistle in chapter 2, verse 15. Why don't we turn there this evening real quick? Put your little uh, bookmark there. First John, chapter 2. Let's 
flip to the right a little bit, a few, a few books. First John chapter 2. John says later on in his, in his ministry and in, in his life, he says, Do not love the world or the things in the world. This is John, uh, 1 John chapter 2, verse 15. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not, the fa- is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away in the lust of it, but he who does the will of God abides forever. John says, here's the lens that the, that the world is looking through. Those who are of the world, he clarifies in his commentary in 1 John chapter 2, he clarifies and he says, here's, here's the, the lens that the world looks through. It is the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. What is the, the lens of the world? How do, how do you clarify, how do you, how do you see, who are the people of the world? It's those who have this lens, who look through this lens, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. This is, this is a heart check for each of us. This is a heart check for you and for me. What drives us in our lives? What lens are we looking through as we live in, in this world, as we are in this world but not of it? What drives us in our lives? Is this what is driving us? Is this, is this what we are passionate about? One of those three, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, or the pride of life? Are, these, are, are, are one of those three, or all of them, our passion? Is it what we think about before we go to sleep? Is it what we think about right when, right when we wake up? What is driving our lives? John says this is not of the Father, but it's of the world. This, is, this would would categorize the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. This is ultimately how Eve was deceived in the very beginning. This is how the serpent deceived Eve at the very beginning with those three things. And this is, the world, this is what the world tries to offer us it's as, as fulfilling, but it only leaves you with the moment of gratification. The world tries to offer these three things to you, saying this is what will fulfill your life. This is what will bring you joy in your life, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. But it only leaves you with a moment of pleasure, and then its ways lead to death and destruction. And maybe that's why you're here tonight. Maybe that's why you're here tonight, because you have been been striving after these things. You've been running after these things only to find yourself empty. You know, we hear this, this uh, from, from so many even celebrities that have reached the top, and yet they're, fi- they're wanting more. That, if, that have all the money in the world, and, and they're asked, what, what is enough for you? And they say, just a little bit more. It's never satisfying. It never leaves them satisfied. It always leaves them empty, and it leads to destruction. And maybe that's why you're here tonight. You're here tonight because you, you notice that your life is empty. I mean, what is going on? I've, I've, been, I've been going after these things thinking that they will bring me joy and I'm, I'm still empty. I still am wanting more. I'm still unsatisfied. It's destroying my life. It destroyed my marriage. It destroyed my relationship with my kids. It destroyed my relationship with my family. What is, what is going on? I thought these things would bring me joy and fulfillment in my life. Now, as we go back to John's gospel, flip back over to John's gospel in chapter 15. Notice here, if you are of the world, the world would love its own. Very interesting. And this is very sobering. This is the reality. If we if we were truly sharing the truth of God's word to the people around us, if we were truly living like we were supposed to, people are, go- people are going to have a problem with it. Because the world loves its own. So therefore, if you're not of the world, it's going to hate you. And so if we were truly living like we were supposed to, if we were truly sharing the truth of God's word like we were supposed to, people would have a problem with it. People would have an issue with it. There are going to be people who have a problem with us loving like Christ loves and living like Christ lived. 
Do the people, so the question for us is, do the, do the people who are closest to us, the people that are closest to you, the people you work with, the people you live life with, do they know you're a believer? Do they know who you follow? Do they notice something different about you? I had a friend, uh, uh, she works at, at one of the casinos, um, goes into work, she's a, a server at one of the casinos, and uh, uh, you know, there was this, uh, this lady, this, uh, this older lady at a, a coffee shop that she kept uh, passing, but she passes by like every single day as, as she goes to work, and uh, she would get coffee there and things like that, and she was like, man, this lady, she was telling uh, my wife and I, this lady's so nice, there's something different about her. She's like, I bet you, I bet you she's saved. I bet you anything that, she, that she's a Christian. And so one day she got the, the courage to go up to her and she goes, uh, hey, I just have a question for you. Um, you know, don't, don't, uh, don't freak out or anything, but are you, are you a Christian? And, and the lady's like, yeah, yeah, I'm a, I'm, I, 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 I'm, I'm a Christian. I've been, I've been a Christian for a long time and all this stuff. And she's like, I knew it. I knew, I knew there was something different about you because nobody should have that much joy working, at, you know, in the, in the midst of, of all this chaos like this, you know. And, uh, and, you know, there was something noticeable about the person even in just their everyday life and what they were doing in their everyday life. My youth pastor, I remember this, uh, this sobering thought when, uh, when I was in, in high school, and, and he shared this at a retreat with, with us. He said, if the people around you don't know you are a Christian, you're probably not. And man, I was like, I, I went to a public school my whole life. Went to a public school my, you know, for, for all of high school and junior high, elementary school, things like that. And, and uh, when, when I, in public school, I had to think about it and think, do people know I'm a Christian? Am I masking myself like everybody else in this school? Am I standing out? Do people notice that there is a difference? It was a sobering thought for me, a, a heart check for me. If the people around you don't know you are a Christian, you're probably not. And that's not as a judgmental thing to point the finger at anybody else but myself. This was a heart check for me. Do people know I, I, who I follow? Do people know when they see me, if I told them, I walk up to somebody I work with and I said, hey, did you know I'm a Christian? Would they be surprised? They'd be like, nah, <laughs> no way. You know, would, would, would it be a surprise to them or would, would they know? Would they know, man, I noticed something different about you. I noticed that there was a difference in you, something, something different. I love this. Uh, um, a couple years ago, you guys know the, the um, uh, hip-hop artist Lecrae. He's won a few Grammys uh, and uh, um, amazing, amazing uh, Christian hip-hop artist and, and uh, um, one, of, one of my favorites to listen to. He's got an amazing message. And uh, he was interviewed on, uh, on BET a couple years ago on, on, uh, on one of their programs. And, and uh, one of the guys, um, you know, is, is interviewing him and he says, uh, what, what is it like to be labeled as a, as a Christian rapper? What is it like to be labeled under like the, the gospel genre? And I loved what he said. He, he uh, I quote, he said, Christianity is my faith, not my genre. Christianity is my faith, not my, my genre. And he went on to say that what hip-hop was all about was it was, uh, it, it is basically a picture of your life and what you live for. So for those that, that, that you know, rap about sex and, and you know, uh, drugs and all of those kind of things and, and money and cars and stuff like that, he's like, that's what people, that's what those people are living for in my life. I happen to be living for Christ. I happen to be living for Jesus, so it, is, it reflects in my music. It reflects in my artwork, not only in my artwork, but it is reflective in my life. And that, that's, it's, Christianity is my faith, not my genre, and I love that. I love that for all of us because sometimes this, the, just the church can become our genre, and we just go to play church uh, for, for just a portion of our life, and we live some, some other life outside of the church. And man, Christianity should be a lifestyle. It should be a lifestyle that you don't turn off when you get, when, uh, you know, when you get to work and turn back on when you get to church. It, it affects our everyday life. As we, as we step into that walk with Christ, Christianity is our faith. It's our walk. It is, our, it is a lifestyle that we portray in everything that we do. And, and people are, who are around us, they should see it. People who are around us, if we are truly walking with Christ and not of the world, it should be evident to the people around us. Verse 20, as we fly through at neck-breaking speed. Sorry. 
Verse 20 says, remember the, world that I, remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will, all, they will keep yours also. But the, all these things they, should, they will do to you for my name's sake because they do not know him who sent me. So he says, if they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. This is the promise of Christ. The promise of Christ, the life of a Christian will always have persecution. That's the promise, that's the promise that Christ gave to each, of, each and every one of us. Those who are his followers were guilty by association, and therefore we are going to be persecuted at some point in our lives. They persecuted Christ, and so as we follow him, we will be exposed to persecution. But the reason is because they are, they are apart from Christ. They have rejected Christ, and so they will reject you and me. Verse 22 says, if I had not come and spoken to them, they would have no sin. But now they have no excuse for their sin. He who hates me hates my father also. If I had not done among them the works which no one else did, they would have no sin. But now they have seen and also hated both me and my father. But this happened that the word might be fulfilled, which is written in their law. They hated me without a cause. There is no good reason for the world to hate Jesus and his followers. Look at all that he has done for the world. Again, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. There is no good reason, there is no just cause for someone to hate Jesus and his followers. He gave his life for the world. It's one thing to give your life for a friend, right? It's one thing, one thing I know many of us uh, or maybe a spouse. I know for myself, if it was my wife, I would give my life for her in an instant, you know? If, if it's a friend, I would get, uh, you know, depending on the friend, I would give, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> just kidding. We, it, it, it's easy, it's, it's one thing to give your life for a friend, but what about a stranger? Would you give your life for a stranger? Well, that depends on the stranger. That depends on who this stranger is. I remember uh, when, I was, uh, when, when, uh, when I was younger and there was a little community pool that, that was in our little complex in our apartments and I was swimming in there with, uh, with, with my sister and, and uh, I, I don't know how old I was, but I was old enough to swim and, uh, and old enough that I remember the story. And uh, I'm swimming kind of in the deeper end and there was this, uh, there was a, a, a mom and, and um, her friends kind of sitting, their, their back is turned to the pool and there was this little two-year-old that was, that was w with, with her. And he turned around and he started w running towards the pool. She had no idea that this was happening. And the two-year-old fell into the pool and fell into the, the deep end of the pool. And I saw it. I swam over as fast as I could. He was like sinking to the bottom. And I grabbed him. I took him out. He started, you know, I, I put him back up on the, on the wall. He starts coughing and it immediately starts crying. I kid you not, this is the, what the mom did. She turned around. She saw him crying, and she picked him up, and she's like, oh, stop it, and just sat there and started patting his back. And I was like, I just saved your kid, lady. <laughs> I was like, did anybody see that right now? <laughs> like, come on. I just became a superhero at like 10 years old. But it really depends on the stranger. Would you give your life for a stranger? But here's another question. Would you give your life for an enemy? Would you give your life for an enemy? I know me, I, it would be really hard. It would be really hard to give my life for an enemy. But here is the, the, the true sto story. While we were yet sinners, this is what the Bible says. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. While we, while we were in the worst of our sins, rebelling against God, rejecting God, while we were in the worst of our sins, while we were yet sinners, Christ saw us and he died for you and for me. He died for the world. Not just for those who would follow him, but for the world. For those who would reject him. He gave his life for even the enemies. There's no good reason or just cause for the world to hate Jesus. It's unconditional, uh, unconditional love. Really, they, they hate Jesus and his followers because they hate that their sin is exposed. That is why the world hates Jesus, because he came with the message. 
He came with the message. It would be one thing if Jesus had never come down and said what he said and did what he did. Jesus said they wouldn't be sinning then. If, they didn't, if I didn't say what I said and did what I did, they, there would be no sin. They, it wouldn't be sinning, but because Jesus, because Jesus came and said what he said, because of what he did for each and every person, there is no excuse for their sin. There is no excuse for their sin. And Jesus, he sheds light to all of that, that all that we try to expo- or to try to, uh, you know, um, hide, he exposes it in his true light. And there is no excuse for our sin. The law has been given. The sacrifice has been made. The gift has been given. And so we are without excuse. The law was given. The sacrifice was made. And the gift has been freely given to anyone who should accept it. And so... We are without excuse. There is no excuse. Thus, by positioning your life against Christ, you not only position yourself against Jesus, but you position position yourself against God the Father. That's what Jesus says here. Did you notice that? He who hates me, in verse 23, he who hates me hates my Father also. By positioning your life against Christ, you not only position yourself against Jesus, but you position yourself against God the Father. He who hates me hates my father also. It's a package deal. So I ask you tonight, what is holding you back? What is holding you back from giving your life completely to God? What is holding you back? Jesus is pouring his love into your life freely and abundantly. He showed you how much he loved you by spreading his hands, by spreading his wrists on the cross for you. Even while you sinned against him, he saw you as he hung on the cross for your sin, he saw you and chose to willingly give his life for you anyways. What is holding you back? There's no good reason to hate, to hate him. He's freely giving his unconditional love for you. Unconditional, you know what that means? There's no condition. It's not because what you, uh, what you have done. It's not what you brought to the table. It's not because one day you're going to repay him back. It's not because you had, you, you had something that he liked, and so he said, well, I like this guy. I'll give, him, I'll give him love. He gave it to you unconditionally. There was no condition. There was nothing you could have done, and he still poured abundantly his love. There's no, there's no limit to his love. There are no boundaries to his love, he pours it abundantly in your life. What is holding you back? What is holding you back? He promises joy. He promises fulfillment in your life. He promises to never leave you unsatisfied. He promises to to never leave you empty, to give you peace in your life. What is holding you back? Well, verse 26. The Bible says, But when the Helper comes, whom I shall send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will testify of me, and you also will bear witness, because you have been with me from the beginning. These things I have spoken to you that you should not be, uh, that you should not be made to stumble. They will put you out of the synagogues. Yes, the time is coming that whoever kills you will think that he offers God service. Interesting. And these things they will do to you because they have not known the Father nor me. But these things I've told you that when the time comes, you may remember that I told you of them. And these things I did not say to you at the beginning because I was with you. This is the amazing thing about the Lord. He knows we are going to be hated. He knows we are going to be hated, and in fact, he promises persecution, but that doesn't mean he's left us all alone. That doesn't mean that Christ left us all alone on this earth to just, you know, fight for ourselves, to walk in in all alone ourselves. Jesus, in his abundant love, sent to us the Holy Spirit. Isn't that amazing? Jesus, in his abundant love, sent to us the Holy Spirit. He has been sent by the Father at the request of the Son to come alongside and to help you. To come alongside and to help you. 
I, I love that song that we sing about the Holy Spirit. We, we're very familiar with it, and uh, in the bridge of the song, the, the song says, let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. And that's the reality is that the presence of God, the Spirit of God, is with us at all times. There's no, he's not, you know, limited to a location. The Spirit of God is not limited to this place alone. And then when we walk out, that's it. And, uh, you know, we can only experience the presence of, of, of the Holy Spirit when we come into service. No, the, the presence of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit, literally, as you put your trust and faith in Jesus, he dwells within your heart and goes with you wherever you go. He's alongside you. He's with you wherever you go, and he's in you wherever you go. And then later on in Acts chapter 2, we get the, the gift of the Holy Spirit coming upon us to do the work of the ministry, to do what God is calling us to do in, in, in ministry. We're not alone here in this life. Jesus has sent the Holy Spirit to come alongside us to be our helper, to help us in our time of need. Well, how does he help us? Jesus says, he will testify of me. Notice there in verse 26 at the end of that, that verse. He will testify of me. This is the job of the Holy Spirit. He's the one convicting hearts and turning men towards Jesus, turning men and women towards the Messiah, towards the Savior. And those of us who have put our trust and faith in Jesus, we're all a product of that. We've all experienced that in our own lives. Remember the conviction when you first found out you were a sinner? Do you remember that conviction? When you first found out that, the, that God was real and that we've sinned against him? Remember the conviction, that, the, the, that little tugging on our hearts? Maybe even this evening you felt that and that's why you came to church. You came to church because there was that tugging on your heart. And you thought, man, I, for some reason, I got to get to church. That is the Holy Spirit drawing you to Jesus, pointing you in the direction of your Savior. That tug on your heart, that little voice in your head that's saying, man, you need to get to church. You need to read your Bible. You need to make your life right with God. That is the Holy Spirit convicting your heart, turning you towards Christ, towards your Savior, the one who would save you, the one who will save you. He says, these things I have spoken to you that you should not be made to stumble. This is Jesus' warning to us. When these things happen, he says, these things are going to happen. They're going to throw you out of the synagogues. They're going to kill you and say it was service to God. They're going to do all these things, persecute you. They're going to hate you. But hey, I've spoken these things that you should not be made to stumble. When these things happen, happen when the, all these things take place, take heart because the Holy Spirit is with you. You're not alone. You can take heart in that. When you are hated, when you're persecuted, the Holy Spirit is with you. When you stand up for truth, when you share the truth in love, the Holy Spirit is with you. Another part of the gospel say that you don't even have to worry about the words you're going to say. The Holy Spirit will give you the words at the right time. You don't even have to worry about what you're going to say. The Holy Spirit is with you, giving you the words to say. And he says you don't even have to fear death. You don't even have to fear death. Because our last breath here will be our first breath in heaven. The Holy Spirit, he dwells within our hearts. What does that mean? We are secured and sealed by the Holy Spirit. So even the worst comes the worst, we die for our faith. Guess what? We don't even have to fear death because our last breath here is our first breath in heaven. We don't even need to fear death. So Jesus here, he says, though we are confronted with hatred and persecution, though we are faced with hatred and persecution on all sides, we are to continue in the love of Christ to continue in his love. Agape love, that unconditional self-sacrificial love, it continues in the face of hatred and persecution. I think of Jesus on the cross. I think about Jesus when he hung on the cross and he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. He turned the other cheek, Father, forgive them for they know not what, he do, what they do. I mean, Jesus, he had every right to strike down, and he had the ability, every right and the ability to strike down every person there, 
Every person that nailed him to that cross, he had the, the free, the, he had the right to do it. He had the right and the ability to do it, yet he turned the other cheek and he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. In the face of hatred and persecution, he poured out his love in the greatest way the world has ever seen. And dying for the sins of the world, taking upon himself the sins of mankind, and showing and demonstrating perfect, unconditional love. Have you positioned your heart against God? Have you positioned your heart against God? Are you rejecting God? Because the fact is that Jesus has never stopped loving you. There's never been a moment where Jesus stopped loving you. He loves you so much he died on the cross for you. He gave his very life for you. He willingly went to the cross for you. His love goes on and 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 on for you. There's no limit. There are no boundaries to his love. My question to you is for those who have never experienced that, for those who have never turned their lives over to the Lord, who have never surrendered to God, would you surrender to Jesus tonight and give your life to him? Stop living for the, the things of this world. Stop pursuing the things of this world because they will only leave you with a moment of pleasure and they will leave you always empty and lead you to destruction. They will give you a moment of pleasure and leave you empty every time. Lead you to destruction every time. But when you abide in Christ, when you abide in the vine, when you surrender to Jesus, you experience the benefits of being connected to that vine. You experience the benefits of being connected to Jesus, to that vine. There is joy, there's fulfillment, there is love, there is peace. Would you surrender to him? Would you repent from your sin and surrender to him tonight? I know God, God is doing a work in this room this evening. And I want to give you the opportunity, maybe you've never surrendered your life to Jesus. You know, my encouragement to those who have surrendered your life to Jesus is that you don't stop loving. Just as Christ never stopped loving you, never stopped loving me. That even in the face of hatred, in the face of persecution, in the face of those comments on Facebook. I, the, the crazy thing is that I, I was looking on our, on our Facebook and seeing the people that we're having, you know, that we're opposed to, to uh, you know, the, the response from Pastor Derek. And I just, it brought a, it brought a smile to my face because, you know, what was crazy is that the, a couple of the guys, they were from like Australia. And I was like, isn't that crazy that the message, the truth of God's word reached all the way out there, like from, from a blog post. And, and that God used this church to, to spread the truth of God's, of God's word and love to over 15,000 people. It's amazing. It's amazing to see what God is doing in, in, in our lives. And, and, and so I, I encourage you, especially in these times, in the face of hatred, in the face of, of persecution, that you love one another, that you pour out the love of Christ, that you share the, the truth of God's word and love. And for those who have never given their hearts to Jesus, I want to give you that opportunity tonight. tonight. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your amazing love for us, God. Your perfect love for us, Lord. Even as we were singing uh, earlier this evening, God, as we, in light of all that you've done for us, in light of your love for us, as we bask in your presence, God, tonight, Lord, we are overwhelmed. We're overwhelmed by you, God. I think about my life, Lord, and what you saved me from, God. The path of destruction I was on. Jesus, you saved my life. You saved me, God. overwhelmed by you, Lord, and your love for me. God, and it wasn't just me, but you loved the world with the same perfect love. 
Lord, we pray that we would, in, in response, would love the people around us with that same type of love. Even in the midst of, of, of persecution, even in the midst of hatred, even in the midst of anger, people being angry, of frustration, trials, tribulations, and storms. God, we would be able to love with that same love that you loved us. God, I pray for those in here, Lord, that have never surrendered to you. God, would you give them the strength to repent this evening, to turn to you, to, to surrender to you tonight, God. To give their lives to you, Lord, to experience the fullness of life in Jesus. To experience the, the amazing life that you have to offer them, the, the, the purpose of their life that they would experience the Holy Spirit living within them, Lord, tonight. Would you give them the strength to, to surrender to you this evening? And as with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, if this is you, you know that you need to get right with God. You know that you, maybe you've been living apart and you've been positioning your heart in rejection, rejection against God. And you know you need to surrender to Him. You know you need to position your heart at the feet of Jesus, surrendering to him. I want to give you that opportunity tonight. I want to lead you in a prayer that begins your life with Jesus. If that's you tonight, and you know that you need to make it right with God. Uh, would you raise your hand so I could pray for you tonight? Know that you need to surrender to God this evening, that you need to repent and surrender to him. I see your hand. Thank you for raising your hand. You know that you are tired of living for yourself, tired of living for the pleasures of this world that leave you empty. You know you need to walk with Christ tonight, to begin that walk with Christ tonight. If that's you, raise your hand so I can pray for you and lead you in that prayer. I know this is a heavy decision. This is a heavy, a heavy decision to make. And I know the Holy Spirit is, is maybe he is convicting your heart right now. Don't, don't ignore it. He's tugging on your heart right now. Don't ignore. Don't ignore it. If that's you tonight, raise your hand so I could pray for you. Is there anybody else? Maybe tonight as well, you, uh, you, know, you were at one point living for the Lord and you know that you've been walking away, you've, been, you've positioned your heart in a way that is rejecting God and you know that you need to, to recommit your life tonight. You know that you need to be that prodigal son or daughter and, and turn your life back to Christ tonight and re repent and, and to make things right with God. If that's you, I want to lead you in the prayer as well. Would you raise your hand so I could pray for you? God, I just uh, lift up these couple people, Lord, that have raised their hands. Lord, and even if those, Lord, you're still working in their hearts, God, and they didn't raise their hand, but they know that they need to make it right with God tonight, would you just give them the strength to stand? In Jesus' name, amen. You know, the Bible talks about how when Jesus called his disciples, he called them publicly, and I want to give you that opportunity to make that public stand for, for God. Uh, you know, Christ, he, he went to the cross for you, and, and it's an amazing opportunity for you to identify with that and to take a stand tonight and to come forward before, before the altar. And, and uh, um, if that was you tonight, if you raised your hand or maybe you were close to raising your hand and you, you know you needed to, if that's you tonight, I want to, uh, as Melena plays the song of worship, I encourage you guys to come forward and uh, before the altar so I can lead you in that prayer tonight. So if that was you, raise your hand, come forward now it's, as Melena plays the song. A refuge for the poor, a shelter from the storm. This is our God. He brings peace to our madness and comfort to our sadness. This is our God.
Now, I know there was at least one of you guys out there, and uh, I know that God is working in your heart right now, and, and let me tell you, I, I understand that, I mean, it's, we got a lot of people in this room, but here's the thing is we all had to make this decision to, to come forward, to make that, that, pro, that public proclamation, to, to give our hearts to Jesus, and I want to encourage you, man, this is, will be the best decision of your life, the best decision you will ever make, and, and uh, don't let the, the fear... Uh, you know, dictate your decision tonight. I know that the Holy Spirit is tugging on your heart. And if, if maybe if you're nervous tonight, grab the person next to you or grab the whole row next to you. I don't care. Grab, grab people next to you to, to come forward tonight so you don't miss out on this opportunity. So if you raise your hand, come forward now as Melania continues in the song. Fall it to the orphan, heal it to the broken. This is our. Well, I'm still going to lead you in the prayer anyways, because I know, I know that you, I know the Lord is working in your heart, and I'm still, I still want to lead you in that prayer today. And so um, if that was you that raised your hand, uh, just uh, repeat after me as you're, as you're uh, seated. Dear Jesus, I confess that I've sinned against you, but tonight, God, I, I give you my life. I believe that Jesus died on the cross for my sins and rose again on the third day. And I believe that through faith in him that I'm a child of God, that I am forgiven, and that my sins are washed as white as snow. Help me to live for you all the days of my life. love you, Lord. I give you my heart. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. If, if that was you this evening that, 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 that prayed that prayer, if you, if you prayed that prayer, I would love to, to be able to pray for you to know, to, to uh, uh, meet you and everything. And I know that there's, there's uh, so, some of our ministry team in the back that would love to as well. And, and so please don't, don't be a stranger. I'd love to, love to pray for you and to, uh, to minister to you. And so um, let's all stand together. Would love for you guys to, uh, you know, again, to encourage you guys, just please pray for us. We're going to need your prayer as we, we go share the gospel in, in Chicago. So love you guys. God bless.